I am going to throw a bird pitcher. I'm going to throw all these things I've got to put together and do things to today. And my work cycles typically, I try to throw, um, I try to throw some things that need work the next day, some things that'll sit in my closet for a couple, a couple days so that I can constantly have pots I need to work on and pots that I can throw each day so that I'm not either spending the whole day putting things together or spending the whole day just throwing pots. And I give myself, I try to think, um, and I learned this from Matt Jones, I try to think about like throwing a certain amount of, or making a certain amount of money of pots a day. Sort of say like, all right, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna try to make $500 in pots in a day. So I can sort of make some things that are small and inexpensive and some things that are large, more expensive and just sort of like spread out that. And then when I go to glaze, I don't have either like a bunch of big stuff or a bunch of small stuff. So with this, I'm going to pull a lip on this or pull a spout. So I'm going to leave a little bit of clay right up here. I'll stop right there. And instead of having that, that really thin lip, I'm going to leave a really big, bulky, thick lip. And usually I measure this out and I'll throw a creamer out of about, about pound and three quarters. And then my medium size at about two and a half pounds. And this is going to be somewhere around medium. Although I have to say, I probably, the, the ones that I like the best when they're all finished and done are those little guys. Those are my favorites out of these, this form. I think there's something about the bigger ones that I just need to work on a little bit more. So in order to get this narrow at the bottom, anybody have trouble getting things narrow at the bottom? <laughs> so I'm going to push, I'm going to push in and then everything else will either be straight up or outward. If you try to push in and go up at the same time, if you just try to like narrow and go up, then that top will get thrown off really, really bad. So I'm going to make this a little bit wider up top here, a little bit more space. So this, I had some Carolina wrens living in my studio at my old house. I built this studio with some help from some friends who had framed houses. And um, we built it in the summertime and I didn't have any, like in, no insulation in it, no sheetrock or anything. And um, in the fall, I decided I should probably put some insulation in because it was going to get cold. And then in the spring, the, the wrens came under the eaves and up and they landed in the uh, top of the insulation, the top of the wall. And they started having building nests and having babies. And so I had like three nests of wrens in my studio. And that was sort of one of the first things that, uh, that got me into thinking about decorating my pots or having birds on my pots with these wrens that were living in my studio. So I'm going to with this, I'm going to think about this like full chest of the bird right up through this area. So I'm going to swell this area a little bit and then I want it to come back towards that top. Sometimes I'll throw down slightly. Think about that like fullness there and coming up from the foot. And this is the, the trick to this having this really narrow foot and I'm stretching this clay out is I can't lean the pot. If I push too hard, if I, if I pull the whole pot to the side, then it'll buckle in the bottom and it'll want to fall. So I've got to keep it really vertical as I work, as I work on this upper area or else it's not going to be happy about what I'm doing to it. So I'm going to, I'm really concentrating on this line right up through here and thinking about where the widest point in this pot's going to be and coming back. So I had these birds living in the studio. And then the other thing that happened was I was teaching 
throwing or teaching pouring vessels at Guilford, and I was having students, and I always had this problem with students who couldn't put, couldn't get this top narrow. So they'd bring in these pots. You know, we'd start pitchers, and the next class they'd bring in these pots that were just sort of up and out. And, and uh, it's hard to put a spout. It's hard to make a pouring vessel on a pot that just goes up and out. And so I took one of them, and I said, oh, you can do this. You can, if you cut sections out of the back and you fold the pot in, then you can, you can like dart this as, it, as though it was fabric and close your opening in the top and put your volume down into the lower part of the pot. And I did this to somebody's pot, and I thought, wow, that's really nice. I should, I should go home and work on this idea. <laughs> no. Everybody did a great job this semester. <laughs> and I'll leave, I'm leaving a little bit of clay down in this base, and um, it adds some weight to the pot, but it's so small down there that it's not. I don't feel like it's that heavy. And sometimes you just have to make decisions that aren't just based on weight, that are based on visual things. I think about these as like little sculptures. I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna see if I can't push that out even a little further. take my little piece of dry cleaning plastic I folded over then this kind of mimics that that uh, metal rib on the side of giving me this really smooth slick surface it's dry cleaning plastic as a sh I use it as a chamois or in, in place of a chamois and it just gives me like a really slick surface and I've got these tools these old bamboo tools that I made back when Guilford had a bamboo forest and I went and picked bamboo. And I just used these, I don't, I don't know why I started doing this. I, I started squaring off my pots when I was in college and I, that's the first time I used a tool like this. But I'll mark the two spots where I'm gonna pull this up. And this becomes like the throat, the front of the bird. It elongates the bird a little bit this way, bird form. And then the other thing I'll do is I'll pull this spout. And I'm going to go across here. I'm going to just pinch this clay. I've got this thicker clay right up at the top here. And then I'll pull straight up. When I first started making pulling spouts, I was leaving a lot of clay at the top. These pictures I was making for my thesis when I was in college. And uh, they were probably, probably twice as much clay, so I had this huge spout. I'd probably pull it up this far and then lay it over a little bit. And having not, you know, I didn't take these home and start using them after I got them out of the kilns. So I just, they looked really good. And my girlfriend's mother got one from me. And I went to use it one time at her house. And if you had too much liquid in it, it would come over the sides before it got to the top of the spout because they were so tall. So you, you have to be careful about that. And this, so this piece, and I'll stick, I'm going to make the little claw foot for the bird. And any time I push in like that, I want to go back and compact it, or else it'll crack later. And I'll just lay this top over. So I'm going to let this set up a little bit. I'll cut two triangles out of the back and fold it together. And this is, that's usually something I've got to do in the same day. 
that I want the clay to be really flexible, but just no longer tacky on the outer surface. You guys have any questions? Do people feel like they need to get up and walk around for a minute? Yeah, it's just a, yeah, I just use a sander at Guilford. It's nice having those. This, this is one I've got from old, that's from 1996 or seven. And these guys are about the same error. And then this is my, when I'm throwing off the hump, I've got this bamboo one. I brought some of this string. If you guys want it, I'll show you some throwing off the hump stuff. And if you want to make a little tool or be able to just tie this onto a cork or something, be able to use it as a cutoff. It works pretty well. Now, where did you get the string from? This is like, like Joanne's fabrics, like button string, or it was some some thing. something, maybe something like that. I've lost the actual bit of paper that went on it, but I've got so much of it that I could give you enough to last your the rest of your life of pottery making. <laughs> Oh, those I probably made it out of green bamboo. And these split over time. But it made a nice little C. I used to use it as a stamp. All right, so the next, next thing, let me make sure this wheel's off before I send it careening around. So see how flexible this is? It's no longer tacky though. I won't leave any, hardly any fingerprint on there. This, this uh, spout though gets stiff faster than anything else because I've pulled it and it's sticking up. The nice thing about working with a clay like B-Mix is that you can smear over it or porcelain and you can smooth it with a sponge and water and you don't leach out all the all the plastic stuff and leave behind all your grit. So I'll go over that a little bit with some, with some water, soften it up. And then try to center this. So with the, with the salt and pepper shakers, this is typical that I would, I would put them together like that. And then I'm going to wait a while before I cut the spout, cut the holes in the top. They're a little bit soft now, so I won't cut the holes yet and the hole in the bottom. Those things will come later. So I have all these, I feel like I touch my pots a lot. I like do something to them, put them aside, do something to them, put them aside. Some people absolutely hate that. And it probably isn't the most efficient way to work. What I'm doing now is I'm just trying to get this in the middle of the back. How do you guys feel about that? Do you like to make things and just get them off the wheel and not have to touch them? <laughs> or, or just like you just want to just as little contact as possible? Or are you somebody who like loves to like labor over the pots and... This is a, just a little piece of cardboard I've cut out. This, this is actually, you know what? This probably isn't big enough for this piece. Let's see what I've got. That one might be too big. I might just have to make up my own. Mm, that will be all right. So I've got these shapes. And the important thing, if you do this technique of like cutting the section out of your wall, is that you're, yeah, is that I cut the same length line on either side. That's why I have this triangle. So it's like this line is the same length as that line so that when I go and put them together, they match up, which seems like obvious, right? But the first couple times I did it, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm gonna cut a lot on this side. And then it's like, wait, that. Do you make those with protractors or do you just fold them in? I just, I just drew it on a piece of cardboard. Just make a square, you know, like so are right all angle. Sides or, the same or just the two? Um, all through, or just the two, just the two sides. Yeah. 
And then I draw this line in. Okay, you guys see that? So I've got my two marks. I like dug in with my uh, with my ruler up top here, drawing these lines. Now when I cut it, I've got to cut at an angle, and this is like another hard part. And I typically cut uh, this way from the back. And I and I don't cut straight on the line. I don't start on the line. I'm going to slide around. I'm going to start off the line and move on to the line because I want a little extra clay here and here so that when I put them together, I don't feel like they're parting right at the top. I want to have a lot of clay there. Uh, the line on the uh, on the outside, but I start it's like I really should have started there. That's where my line comes to the top, but I start over a little bit. And the same thing over here. So I held the knife this way, sort of pointing towards there, and I've got to do the same thing over here. And this is the hard one. As I cut down, your tendency is to want to do this and straighten out, but you got to cut down and back and kind of pull the knife around. So that I have. I've cut that angle in here, and on the pot, I have this face, and then the opposite on the inside. And so it's like a joint, it's like a 45 degree angle or like more that I'm laying up against each other. still soft enough. Okay, so I've cut those two spots. And typically this is soft enough. I'll lean that in like that. Fold that back over. This is going to have a very small opening at the top. But that'll make for like a really fat little bird have that small opening. And I, I'm getting to this a little bit later than I'd like to, so I'm going to put a, a tiny bit of magic water on it. You guys know magic water? Yeah. Hmm. Does anybody see my red? Oh, there it is. A little bit of sodium silicate in the water, a little bit of a little bit of um, soda ash. I got this recipe from Malcolm Davis. You guys know Malcolm Davis, Malcolm Shino. He was like a really flamboyant potter who found pottery much later in his life. And he, had, he was a, had been a minister for a long time up in Washington, D.C. And uh, he just passed away like a year ago. So unexpectedly had hip surgery and was doing fine afterwards and then had like an aneurysm or something and then passed away during physical therapy. But so he was this minister, but he, I took a workshop with him at Penland and he was, he's just like constantly chatting and big guy. He's just, he was just a funny guy. He was fun to be with for two weeks, but he called it holy water because he was this minister and so <laughs> like made this. Sodium silicate, then what's the other thing? Soda ash. If you go on to, uh, you can look it up online. There's a lot of people who've published the recipe. It's like a tablespoon of sodium silicate per gallon and like, I don't know, like 10, ounce, 10 grams of soda ash maybe. So now I'm just putting this, this edge together. I had a little spot right here that felt a little bit thin, so I'm just going to smear some clay over it. Yeah, so I'll try to do this so you can see it. Do you, I'll, do you use the magic water exclusively instead of slip? Yeah, you know what? I was having all this problem with slip and um, slip, yeah, like yeah. pots cracking where I'd slipped them, like handles, and I thought, I'd put so much slip on that. How come that's cracking? And, uh, and then one of my former students told me, 
that he had he had heard from some potters, maybe um, uh, Tom Coleman. I think he had heard from Tom Coleman that it's like, yeah, slip is the worst thing to use for porcelain. That wa- it better use water than it is to use slip. And um, and then so it, I just started using magic water, and I've had less issues. And you don't score. Not for something like this. Now this is really wet. When I put handles on mugs, I do score quite a bit. But this, sorry. I, I have used vinegar before, but not consistently. I think I had some around and I used, uh, maybe I put some in my slip. It was okay. I mean, I didn't, slip wasn't terrible, but magic water's pretty good. So any place that I've, I've, I have this split now that I've put back together and, um, and where that happens, I want to I want to put a bandage across that area that that crosses over. That if I, even if I just sort of put those smooth those things back together, they're likely to open up later, especially this clay. So put a little bit of put a little ball of clay in here, and it'll also be this transition from one wall to the other, so it's not a corner. You know, cor- any place you have like a sharp corner, even if you cut it in and it's a solid piece. Any place you have that sharp interior corner, you're likely to get a crack. More likely to get a crack, I guess, than anywhere else. So I'll use a tiny bit of water just to soften this. And I'll do this before I start to really manipulate the, the spout area or anything. Yeah, this is my, this is my Carolina Wren right here. I have a, a tail that comes up in the end. But yeah, it's very bird-like. And so I'm just going to rub my finger down in here and make sure I smooth over that joint. And sometimes I'll put a ball in the corner if I feel like it needs it. I don't know how, I can't really reach the corner, so this one definitely doesn't need it. (laughs) Okay. When we were at, did anybody here go to the Potter's Conference down in, um, yeah. yeah, did you notice how, like, a lot of them use the same tools? Yeah. It's like everybody used an X-Acto knife. Those, the, the Michael Sherrill ribs, it's like everybody used one of those, like, quite a bit, not just occasionally, but I thought, I was going to ask, but I thought it would be snotty of me to ask, but it was like, what did you guys do before? For the, for the, you know, for these surfaces before you had those tools, like, did you just not have the same surfaces or? So I'm going to use this rib to kind of de- redefine um, this edge down here and to smooth over that surface. So you see that difference here? And so it's a way to kind of transform this from looking like it was put together to looking like it, it was made that way from the start. And then I'll smooth over it with my finger or with a sponge and work this area. Can you guys see what I'm doing? Should I turn this a little bit? What's that? (laughs) Okay. And then comes the fun part. Let's see. I'll start with this corner over here, see if I can get my hand in. A little closer. So I'm going to round off this corner to start with. Pack that down. And then I'll push this up and in. Huh. 
And I think about this as like the, that like shoulder of the bird wing or I really need to get my hand down on it. I don't know if I. This is like an odd size in between. Yeah, this this is something that um, this like paddling part. I used to try to just round these corners off, and I didn't want them to be. I I didn't want to have this edge here, and then at some point I decided, you know what, I'm gonna. I started doing it one time, and I thought I'm gonna see if I what I can do with that corner, and I like the I like the way it changes the shape of the back of the pot. So then the next thing I'll often do to these, transform them even more. I'll push this back down slightly like this. Kind of accentuate that rise up to the, to the mouth, the spout. And I can also pull, kind of pull this back a little bit so that, so that chest, that chest of the bird looks like it's like arcing backwards. You guys see that by opening that up. You gotta have like a special brush to clean this one to get down in there. So then the last thing, so I talked about have, having those spouts when I was first out of college and or like at the end of my college where I was like pulling that really high spout and, uh, and it was pouring over the edge before I got to the top. Well, I think about that with these two, and these work okay, but I, you can still sometimes get a little bit of crest over that area. So I'll also have been adding in some clay to, to build a little bit of a baffle at the top. And I'm going to go a little bit smaller than I have in the past and see how it works. So I'll roll out a little teardrop shape, place it on here. And this is, I think this is valuable to see me do something like this and to think about, to just think about your work not as like a thrown piece, but it's like how do you get how do you take your work or piece to that to the point at where you feel like it's resolved and finished? If it's not on the wheel, are there other ways to do it? Does it have to be done on the wheel or can it be done by handwork afterwards? And so I just decided at some point, I was like, oh, well, I can't really, I can't get this any other way besides adding it on. So I should just add it on. And, uh, And not feel like I've got to sort of finish it on the wheel, or after I've cut it, it's put Where it back together. It would be tough to cut like that, wouldn't it? Yeah. I don't know. You'll see me as I put as I put a handle on a mug. I go back and add clay into certain spots. And uh, I know other potters who don't have to go back and add clay. They can just do it and they make the handle, but. What's that? The herringbone, like that goes narrow and then to thick. Yeah, did, uh, Julie, or uh, Tara Wright makes a handle s s like that, that's like really thin in the middle and thick at the ends.
your wife ever uh, see a pot that she just has to keep out of, the, out of your feelings? How often does that happen? I can't sell this one. <laughs> Usually it goes like this. I sold it, and she's like, I wish you hadn't have sold that one. <laughs> she's, um, she forms third graders into, into learning. <laughs> She's a third grade teacher in the public schools. She's taught, she's taught every type of kid. She's taught like upper income, wealthy, smart kids. She's taught the, sort of like the lowest, in some of the lowest schools in Greensboro, like really tough population where, where the parents and the community doesn't have a lot of trust in the school system or probably didn't have a very good experience in the school system themselves. And, um, they call those Title I schools. And, uh, and she's, a, she's a really amazing teacher with all, with all sorts of kids. That's a very wise thing to say okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, yeah, I hope she watches this. Maybe I'll, uh, <laughs> maybe for our anniversary I'll like put this on. <laughs> Oh yeah, my my youngest daughter. If she really want, likes to get out there, she really wants to uh, wants to play with the clay, and she'll want to work on the wheel too. Well, as it warms up or in the summer comes, she'll spend a lot of time out there. Both of them will, but my youngest seems to take after it a little bit more than my older daughter. All right, so you guys, let's see, pop this off. Ah, did I cut under? I did, but it's still very soft. I can't pop it off. Well, that's good. So you see that? So I've built that like little baffle to channel that water. I've kind of bent those bits in a little bit too. All right, and I'll let that set up for a little bit, a little bit longer. So this is the weirdest handle that I do. And, um, and it just looks like it's gonna be so uncomfortable. I guess, seeing those pots over there. There's this North Carolina pitcher called a Rebecca pitcher. You guys seen these? That long neck and the handle that goes up and then down. And, um, and, I, and I read someplace that they were used, you could, you, you could travel with liquid in them pretty easily without having it slosh out. And because the handle is like a little bit higher and the center of gravity is way low in the pot that it's kind of easy to hold and carry. I used to make these with about five pounds of clay and they were big. And I thought they were a little bit cumbersome to, um, to like have liquid in and pour. So I stopped making them as large. And then I got better at making them so I could make them bigger and thinner than with that six pounds of clay and get kind of close with my largest ones. But I, I don't know if I should make them large and just people can collect them as, as just visual pieces. I kind of like my things to function if they're, if they're supposed to function. Like the teapot, the whirling teapots, they're not the, I would say out of the teapots I make, they're probably not the easiest to use, but certainly if you use them, they're going to pour right and they're not going to drip and, and you can get liquid in them and it steeps tea well. In fact, that first one I was telling you guys yesterday that, that I had one get into, uh, get into Don Davis's book, and it was the first thing I got in there. So I didn't sell it, and instead I held on to it, and I used it. Well, actually, I used it for about a year before the book came out, and I knew I was in it, and then I, put it, and then I decided I wasn't going to use it anymore. It was like the first thing I'd ever gotten published. I was so proud of myself, and uh, it seemed like a really good omen. So I, I stopped using it, but I, I, I used it almost every day for a long time. And I was able to not break it. It was good. <laughs> Some people come back to me and they, about just any pots that I bought from me. They go, oh, I, well, I broke that one. And I'm like, wow, I've got kids. 
They touch them all. They help me unwrap them and wrap them up. They, we use pottery in my house all the time, and we hardly ever break anything. And maybe it's because they're my kids and they're around pots, and I don't know. Does anybody here break a lot of pots? Your cats do. Well, there you go. Can't really control them the same way. They don't understand that talk, that stern talk. Like, got to be careful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm leaving a lot of clay in this. This is going to be the part that attaches down low, and then this is going to attach at the top, and it's going to bend in that middle part there. And with these, I'm thinking I, you need to get a, be able to get a couple fingers in them. This isn't going to be very heavy. I've got a smaller version. I've got one at home about that size, the one that I've got, the small one over there. And this morning we had pancakes and had some homemade blueberry syrup that I had, to, had made before and froze some and reheated it in the microwave in one of those. So a little syrup container. How many of them are there? Are there like there's one on Battleground that's good? There's there's one out in Oak Ridge that's really good. Mm-hmm. Some other colleagues of mine at Guilford, uh, Roy Nydorf, who teaches printmaking and drawing, and Terry Hammond, who runs the gallery, they uh, they've been to Italy a few times. And when that one came out to Oak Ridge, they went out and met the owner Tony and talked to him about Italy and stuff. And then they go in there, and he would just like bring out. Just like appetizer after appetizer, just like yeah, give it to him, and uh, and I went with them one time, and he, they just like showered us with food, and it was so good. <laughs> so again, I'm I'm working that that clay out for my handle, and this one's got to come almost straight up off of the back here, as to be this wren tail, and so I'm just kind of working that clay out. And I'll scratch it quite a bit. Oh. Now these, I have, I've had problems. I still have problems with these cracking off. And um, one of the things I've worked out is after I add this handle on and it stiffens up a little bit, you can, I can do it while it's soft too, is I'll take a needle tool and I'll put three holes back through the attachment of this handle. And then, uh, and I'll cover them up on the outside. And I just, I feel like it's a place for, for moisture to escape. And so there's no pressure on the handle because I feel like they crack, not because they're not on there good, but because like something, they just like separate, you know, they just like pop separate. And um, I try to center it between my two little wing bits. get this on there and then I'll work it in and I use that this tool again I don't know if it's I don't know I don't know if it's because I've bent the clay right here quite a bit I've like asked it to do something that I don't normally do you know like folding this clay in um, and then there might be some like tension with that. I don't know. And it might be that I just don't let them dry enough. I'm trying to get them through the kiln. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have it happen all the time, but I'd have it happen enough that I thought, huh, that's not good. I'd much rather lose a pot through the bisque than after I've decorated it because that decoration just takes, takes a lot of time. Well, uh, the crack like that's tough to fix. If it's before bisque, I can fix it. And then I'll just, just smush this down a little bit. Try to keep that flat. Oh, you know what I should do to this before I put it on? 
smooth it out, make it look nice. And then flip this over. Right. And then I just have to reattach it. And I feel like there's enough clay in there that if, if it's not, if it doesn't feel large enough, then I can, uh, I can add a little, I can like pull a little bit out of it and make it a little bit longer. Do this too. I'm going to just add a little bit. Now that I talked about it cracking. <laughs> It'll get under there. And I'll bite right into the side of this handle right here and just stick it on good. And then I'll just add clay to the corners and backfill it. But I want to make sure I get this on there really good. That's my most, most important thing right now. The visual stuff can come later. Are you guys thinking about what you're going to eat? <laughs> Pancakes sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I like to make some blueberry syrup. Sometimes I'll just reshape this handle from the inside here, pushing some clay down and around. Ray, can you imagine me doing this at Guilford and just spending like a yeah. class period? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I might lose some when I say we're going to go in and do a demo. Ah, just let me do what I want to do. I think it's it's weird though. It's like that you can students will go through that program and never really see me like make my work. They just unless they go out of their way to do it. Yeah, and maybe they don't. Maybe they shouldn't see everything. You know, like I wonder if if it would change the way my like Katie and Kada and Sammy, what they did for their thesis, had they seen me, had I been like working in that studio alongside them. Yeah. So I'm gonna add add a little volume to this handle out here. Give a little spring to that tail. And I'm about halfway through with this now. I just got to cut the bottom and <laughs> there's a few more things to do to it. But I think it's, it feels like it's stuck down pretty good. I might wait till it dries some more. The other thing I'll do is I'll put little, little eyeballs on it. Some people look at this and they think frog and I can't blame them. So I had this, this pot, I have these pots that I paint, decorate with animals. And then this, this pot's sort of like the, the animal. And I decorate it to have like a, a surface, like a bird, like wing surface or bird feather surface.
So I'll cut a little bit off the back of that foot. 